Hello from the Lincoln Center in downtown Spokane. I'm Teresa Lukens, and thanks for joining us for a special community forum exploring homelessness in Spokane. Like you at home, our audience here at the Lincoln Center has just finished watching the KSPS documentary, Hidden in Plain Sight. Many of them are members of the Spokane Homeless Coalition and deal with the challenges of homelessness every day. We're looking forward to hearing their perspectives on a problem that defies simple solutions. To begin the conversation, we've assembled a distinguished panel representing public and private organizations fighting homelessness. So let's meet them now. Representing the City of Spokane is Mayor David Condon, City Council President Ben Stuckert, and Fire Chief Brian Schaefer. Joining them is Phil Altmeyer. He is Executive Director of the Union Gospel Mission, and Rob McCann, President and CEO of Catholic Charities. Shauna Sampson oversees homeless services for SNAP, or Spokane Neighborhood Action Partners. Dave Scott is Director of Rental Assistance Programs for Spokane Housing Authority. Aza La Riviere is Director of Community Support Services for Frontier Behavioral Health, the region's largest provider of mental health and substance abuse treatment. And Joe Ader is a pastor and director of Open Door Shelter for Homeless Families, the city's first 24-7 shelter for families. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'd like to start our conversa conversation by asking the administrators of the city's two largest homeless shelters, uh, where Spokane's homeless population stands as we get closer to the winter months. And Phil Altmeyer, let's begin with you from Union Gospel Mission. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, 31 years I've been doing this, and I think we experienced this summer uh, for the first time seeing something we've never seen in our city. So the question remains as we move into the winter, how many of those people will leave? How many will stay because of the weather? But I'm sure just like last winter, we'll have a lot that'll choose to stay out and go to our warming centers. And our numbers are definitely not decreasing. And I know we're, we're not into the cold months and we're filling up. And Rob McCann, Catholic Charities. Yeah, you know, I think we stand in a place of hope. Uh, we were able to shelter, we think, most of the street homeless folks last winter for the first time, I think, in the history of the community. And thanks to the city of Spokane and the mayor and city council president and others, uh, we're able to do that again this winter with 24-7 sheltering. The numbers are high, uh, the, the problems are profound, and the challenges are great, but we believe we can shelter the street homeless. We believe that every human being should have the ability to sleep inside and eat inside and shower and do the basic things that we all take for granted. And uh, you know, thanks to 24-7 funding and Family Promise and Salvation Army and others, we are able to solve chronic street homelessness in Spokane, I think. Uh, and we're gonna do that again this winter, and I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that as we build more housing, the numbers will go down, uh, and we have to have some hope in that. We can't give up and we can't say it's not solvable because everything's solvable. A few things happened since the documentary was shot and produced. And one of those is the, um, the landscaping that was placed under the overpass. And Council President Ben Stucker, that was an initiative of yours originally. No. No? It, uh, my name was all over it, but it wasn't my initiative. It was planned street improvements that everybody agreed upon from the administration to the entire city council. And it definitely didn't originate in my head. But I was the only one that talked to the press. So then I got attached to it. Okay. And it became the Ben Stuckert rocks, which people still stop me in the grocery store and talk about Ben Stuckert, why did you put those rocks there? Um, I actually issued an apology because I felt awful talking to some of my friends that are homeless on the streets and how that came across and looked to the community. But it did spawn a conversation. There was a community meeting that followed that, so something yeah, we did have a, came out of it. A forum at the city council meeting where over 200 people showed up and we asked for solutions to the problem, and so we tried to uh, make uh, lemonade out of the lemons, or out of the rocks. <laughs> so to speak. Um, one of the other initiatives, Mayor Condon, was the uh, parking meters that were designed to collect money for the home, homeless. Well, you, you've brought together uh, uh, many different tactics, and just like the council president talked about, uh, that we just saw in the video. Uh, the reality is there's many facets to this. They identified in the video 
and really identified uh, the different populations, whether that be veterans or youth or singles or families. And just like you see up at this table, it's gonna take a myriad of approaches. So you just in your last comments have picked two tactics. Um, and just like the uh, President uh, Stuckert just said, uh, the issue of um, crime reduction by environmental design in, in the issue of providing safe places, because just like the council president, I too have spent a lot of time uh, along I-90 and talking to those folks, and without getting into individual stories, the reality was there's humic trafficking that is going on underneath I-90. We were providing the, in, in essence, the shelter or the places where you could hide this, um, uh, the reality is we needed to bring that from out of the, the darks of alleys. Um, and yes, it brings it out into plain view, which I think just like the title of this uh, documentary talks about, we need to see those things. But another piece is the commitment to the public of to give real change, that if you want to make the changes, these organizations here and many others are part of finding those solutions. And so when people are going, what do I do, Mayor, and, and, and how do I address this, uh, there is an option for them. And that's where uh, the city stepped in with, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a teeny little piece. And some of it has more to do than the money we receive than uh, putting it in plain view. I, I saw that idea literally in the airport of uh, Denver. Uh, whereas you're wake, winding through the, uh, uh, the TSA line, they ask you to dump your spare change uh, in, in a meter and said, well, here, you know, people try to get rid of their change so that they don't have to put it through the meter. And so that's, but it's really to talk about what it means to give real change. And each one of these organizations here, um, to include our own fire department and our police department, uh, the myriad of, of efforts, and I think the documentary did a great job at this in a very difficult uh, subject of where are all the pieces that come together, because every homeless story is different, and every strategy has to be as individual as the individual experiencing homelessness. I mean, it is that involved. And so, yes, it's another strategy, but it's a small tactic in a, in a huge labyrinth of strategies to address this issue. How much money was raised so far? You know, to date, I don't have the exact numbers. It's, you know, it's in the hundreds of dollars. It's not in the tens of thousands. It's not necessarily um, for that. It's really for the, the, the idea that we get that, uh, that focus on it and to realize that there's an option. And you see the signs going up. Need help, dial 211. Give help, dial 311. Because you gotta, you got to simplify it, unfortunately, in today's you know, Twitter world of what are the quick ways of, because people want to be engaged, that are driving to work, that are, because uh, homelessness and drug addiction affects literally every family. And they just, uh, there's huge despair to, from the givers, as much despair as you see in those that need the help. They just don't know what to do. Um, and so if there's that other option, and, and hopefully we raise more than that so that we can, we can distribute it to those that are providing the services. Mm -hmm. A lot of reasons people are homeless, obviously. One of the pieces uh, is mental health, the mental health issue. And Aza, um, you see this quite a bit. Uh, address the mental health piece of the homeless issue in Spokane. Um, I think that um, I, I work almost exclusively with people who um, are in recovery from mental illness, and it's a pretty complex um, situation, and, and these folks have a lot of barriers that interfere with their ability to obtain and sustain housing. Um, I think that our strength as a community is going to be working together um, and recognizing these people as part of our community and having the ability to recover and give back in our community. Um, they aren't invisible, um, and uh, they need our support and they need to, to be able to trust. And so we need to earn their trust and sometimes it takes a little longer because um, it's not very effective if you force um, housing or services on someone. Mm -hmm. What's the answer? Is there one? Are, are, do some choose to be homeless? Do they want to just simply live on the streets? Um, I met one person once that uh, had a hard time living in uh, a home and um, he chose to ride railroad cars, cars across, across the nation. But um, by and far, nobody wants to live on the streets. Um, I think that each one of us can imagine, you know, sleeping outside and what that must be like. But I, I think that there are times when 
Um, you know, if we, we stay home from work sick, um, we forget that people don't have that option. Um, people don't have the option um, or feel that they have the option of taking medications that could have side effects that sedate them because they can't protect themselves. Um, people don't have access to resources or transportation, um, and so it's really difficult for them to, um, to, to get out of that rut and, and um, to progress in the community. And addiction also a big piece, and we saw in the documentary that many years ago, Phil, when you started with Union Gospel Mission, that the issue was alcohol, but now uh, the drug piece has come into play. Yeah, there's no question. And I, you know, it's interesting. We, I just got back from another city our size, and I would say this summer in our own city, we have never seen the numbers that we have seen of people that are choosing to stay outside. I know the documentary that we just watched, there's a lot of heart in that and what people expressed. You asked an interesting question, do people choose to be homeless? I've asked that our next homeless survey, we ask that question because due to the drugs, due to the choices people, there's many that are choosing that lifestyle in our country. It's just not Spokane, it's everywhere. And that's becoming, that's something we've never seen in homelessness. And it's every city's facing it and it's growing, it's growing, it's a lifestyle. And I think most people that aren't addicted to drugs that people here tonight, we'd say, we can't comprehend that, we can't understand. And one of the things that I would say over the years that I've observed, there are so many services and that's what I appreciated about watching this. There are so many services available to those that want the help. The challenge we have is how do we motivate? How do we move people in that direction? And one thing I've learned over the years, I can't change anyone. There's only one person. And we all have been given this incredible gift called free will and choice. And we can help those that want the help. And that's what we're facing as a society today. There's those that want it. There's those because of their addiction, because of mental illness, will not make the right choices. But we have a younger generation of people that this is becoming their lifestyle. And so I don't know how you change that. I think you, you say it's about hope, but unfortunately, circumstances, choices, it's a tough thing. As much as you want to love and help people, there's some, I mean, families have gone through it with their own kids. You know, it's tough, but it's a cultural change that we're seeing that we've never experienced. One of the most difficult pieces seems to be families in this situation. Um, we have a lot of shelters for men, women, children, but is it more difficult for families? Fam families are a different situation altogether. Uh, they have a different type of homelessness than, than singles. It, it, it's very different. You're, uh, when people come into our shelter, that's their worst day, right? Because you're homeless with family with nowhere to go, homeless with kids. and so. Um, they are a different population, but there's also different types of needs and different types of resources that uh, they need and that are also available within the community, within the school system. Uh, and we try to work together to get all of those systems uh, working together for these families. Um, and there's uh, a growing population uh, of homeless families. Uh, we're pretty close to full on our shelter every night. Uh, and, and getting close to that on the day shelter as well. So, um, but, uh, but also with families, there's a different level of, of hope uh, because you are caring for somebody else. Uh, and so by the time that you hit um, one of the other single shelters, you've already lost your kids. Um, and so what we see is we see families that uh, are, a lot of them are involved with the CPS system. Um, but they're working a plan. They're trying to get things going, trying to get back on their feet uh, with their families. They just need a little bit of help to do that. Mm -hmm. I want to turn now to a couple that's in the audience um, that were featured in the documentary, Dennis and Jackie Arsenault. Uh, they were staying at the Open Doors Shelter during the day and sleeping at the Salvation Army at night, all the while looking for work and also caring for their two children and they are both here this evening, and we want to thank you so much for being here. And Dennis, I know you want to say a few words. Yes, ma'am. First of all, I want to thank Open Doors. Um, they literally had the only open door for our family. 
when uh, we needed them. So thank you very much, Joe. We appreciate everything Family Promise has done. And, uh, you know, if there's anything we can do to help facilitate any outreach, anything that Family Promise does to help the community, I'd like to help be involved in. Um, Just seeing that story, uh, that story that, that aired there, and, and actually, I hope there's a follow-up because your story since then is really, really exciting and promising. So uh, I like that part as well. You know, there's several other entities here that have helped us out, uh, Catholic Charities. You know, that they gave us the money to get into a house, helped us pay our first few months rent. Uh, I want to thank you for that. Frontier Behavior Health. Uh, ESSA, I work with, uh, I work with a clinician out there at Ledger Wood Office. I, I couldn't ask for a better one. Um, he, he's guided me through a lot of rough times, and I'm here today because of him, and my wife as well. <laughs> um, you know, I, I sat down today and actually for about the past week and, and thought about everything I could think of to, to bring up, to make points here. Now, I threw all that out the window as soon as the movie was over <laughs> because it shows me that the people in charge, that our mayor, that the people in charge of all our charities, they're actually paying attention. They're listening. The only thing left to do really is ask more questions. That was also a point that was brought up. You know, ask more questions on questionnaires when we bring people into these, you know, shelters and stuff like that. The more information we get out of them, the more detail we can make their plans for success. Giving somebody a home doesn't necessarily mean, you know, they're going to go out, they're going to be successful. There might be smaller barriers that are causing their issues. We throw a house on them. We throw utility bills on them. We throw these responsibilities that they're not ready for. The, it, it's definitely a multifaceted approach, and I don't think I'd rather be homeless in another town. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Dennis, how are your kids? They're good. They're <laughs> kids. Um, they, they, they've made it through this. Um, they still see the struggles. They still see us, you know, dealing with what we dealt with mm -hmm. before we lost our home. But we're back in a home. They have their bedroom. They're happy. Talk more about the process. Um, are, you, are you in counseling now? Because you did mention that it's, it's a am. continuing I, I process. I go every week. I see a clinician down there for, for uh, my mental health issues, which was depression, anxiety, um, you know, panic attacks, all following a suicide attempt. You know, I should have reached out for help long before it got to that point. That's another issue that uh, I've seen the city's taking the initiative to push is, is uh, making people aware of mental health issues and what they look like from the outside. You know, we used to just kind of depend on this person to, okay, I've got a problem. I need to solve it. Well, in reality, when you get into that mindset, you stop thinking. All you're doing is processing what little information you can just to get through the day. It really does take somebody from the outside to say, hey, you've got a problem. Hey, you need to go see some help. And uh, with the push of that, you know, and asking people to step in and kind of point things out, that's, that's definitely going to be a big help. Well, congratulations. Thank you. We appreciate you being here tonight. We also invite uh, any one of you to come to the microphone this evening with your questions or comments for our panel. Um, uh, in the meantime, I uh, want to talk more about uh, affordable housing. And Dave Scott, that's where, where you come in. Uh, talk about, d we don't have enough, obviously, affordable housing in Spokane. Can we build it fast enough? No. Yeah, it, it's a great thought process to think we can build our way out of the, the situation. But it's really working with what we have, the best resources we can put toward that, and working with landlords on some of the voucher programs and the subsidy programs to, to assist in housing people. And if not, I'll bring you in on this, but finally <laughs> talk about your involvement. So at SNAP, we are the lead of the coordinated entry sing system for singles, and we also implement a few different rapid rehousing programs, which provides rental assistance. Uh, and, and the reality is, is we're serving people with pretty high barriers, criminal histories, bad credit, no income, mental health issues, 
all of those things. Um, and so when the rental market is, is so challenging, it's really difficult uh, to, to get individuals into housing. And we have to put a lot of work into our relationships with landlords and, and what have you so that we can help them secure places to live. Even if we do have the rental assistance, um, it's, it's very, very common that we're granting extensions for housing search process just because it is taking so long. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes the housing that people are getting into isn't the best. Most of it downtown? No, it's, it's scattered all throughout the city of Spokane and Spokane County. Okay. Uh, Brian Schaefer, I want to bring you in on this conversation as well. Um, your department uh, works with homeless people on a daily basis. You get calls. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think um, we spend, obviously, a lot, a lot of time at the House of Charity and several of our other uh, partner agencies purposefully. One of the benefits that we found specifically with the House of Charity is before when we had um, a non-centralized area where we could focus, in, in the case of House of Charity, a clinic right next to uh, their location, we used to respond all over the Spokane community trying to lend assistance to people that are in need, specifically homeless people. And now we have uh, a partnership with, uh, with House of Charity to provide those services on site and also with Providence uh, having a clinic. It's really improved the way that we deliver medicine in, in a pre-hospital fashion with our homeless population. What kind of calls will you start to see as we move toward colder winter weather? Well, the, the cold, exact, and I, I think you saw a lot of it on uh, the documentary, but the cold really exacerbates uh, the human condition. So if, if you have any type of a problem or you're a vulnerable adult or a child, it, it really makes things worse. Uh, oftentimes, you, you know, people are really trying to survive in those conditions and, and without a home, some type of a shelter, uh, it, it it's literally puts their life at risk. So it's a very serious situation. We've uh, we've exercised a program through uh, the support of the mayor's office and the consul to deploy these alternative response units out into our neighborhoods and into the downtown urban core. And they're uh, they're armed with blankets. And we we deliver blankets throughout the winter. We check on people. We try to encourage folks to get into the shelter and if need be we take them there. So we've really we've really changed the the model of the big fire truck, the big red truck and, and only going to fires to try to adapt our services to meet the need. I think there's two key pieces that you've seen uh, that are fundamentally different here. The council president and I and others visited other uh, communities and cities in the Intermountain Northwest, Salt Lake City, Boise and Portland and the coordinated uh, entry should not be taken lightly, that our nonprofits are willing to come together, find out uh, who has the resources, but agree on a single questionnaire so you don't have the infamous, many that live traditional you know, lives that go to the doctor and they feel like they fill out the same form every time, very similar, even exacerbated to those that are in very vulnerable positions. And in this community, we've decided to do this together. One key piece in one of the populations not touched on was our veterans. Um, and Goodwill Industries is a key component in, in the veteran services. And just uh, met with a gentleman today that's been here from September uh, that just got here and couldn't believe the services provided Provided. And it is just, it's not just housing, it is all the other components that all of these partners, but the piece, and I have to, I have to say thank you to our, our agencies, our nonprofits that are, are willing to come together to do that. And the second thing is really, how do we create an environment that in many ways, because people are suffering from drug addiction or mental illness, don't have the normal boundaries that maybe those that are, are functioning in society have. And so making it more, you know, enclosing those boundaries to help them make the right decision. They still have free choice, but you need to also facilitate that. And if that means getting them out of the back alleys, getting them out of where they're trafficked, 
getting a, you know, coming down on those that are preying on them through drug addiction or, or prostitution and others is a component of attacking homelessness. Um, it doesn't always feel that way, but we still need to have that component to help those that are, that are suffering from, from these addictions and, and, and mental health issues to facilitate their decisions because they aren't working with all of their, their, their facilities because of the, these things that inhibit that. All right, we want to get to the uh, questions from the audience. Oh, this is perfect because uh, I, I'll just follow up on what the mayor has just said about the, the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable, and those are the people with the serious mental health issues. Uh, first off, I want to give a plug for a Facebook page called Homeless in Spokane. Uh, I'm a moderator on that page, and on a daily basis we are uh, fielding questions from homeless people about uh, what they can do, and we have a, uh, several different uh, pages of resources for them to get into the system uh, and uh, get plugged in with like these folks on the stage here and the other uh, folks from the Spokane Homeless Coalition. Uh, but what the mayor was saying about these persons with serious mental health issues is the reason why I'm in this. And I can give you an example that's a perfect example. Two years ago, the city had to settle with the family of a homeless woman who was so mentally ill that she left the women's day shelter to sleep in a vacant lot uh, uh, on a night when it was snowing. And in the morning, a city truck backed over her and killed her. And uh, the city ended up spending $250,000 that they could have spent uh, helping the homeless because there was no uh, shelter that could help this seriously mentally ill woman. Even today, there, uh, persons with these kinds of illnesses uh, go into the shelter and they think that uh, people are talking about them and maybe trying to harm them. And that might or might not be true, but they believe it. Uh, if you give that person housing first and put them in a normal apartment, they will hear the sounds of other people in that apartment through the walls of the apartment, and they will think those people are trying to hurt them unless they're uh, uh, very carefully monitored and, and kept on their medications. Uh, it, uh, the city of Spokane does not have a program now, and as far as I know, and I've been asking for quite some time, they don't have the type of housing that these seriously mentally ill people need. Uh, and they, they are the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable, and the city needs to find a way to humanely deal with those people. Thank you. Council President Stuckert. Well, I agree. I think... I understand you can't build your way out of the problem, but right now, coordinated care, I have 12 people that I met at a um, Sunday lunch program that I'm following that are homeless, and they're on the list, but there's no housing for them. Their risk factors are such that they're above the number 250. We're only able to house so many people. We have 450 people that have housing vouchers in our community that can't find housing, and there's multiple ways to look at the housing problem but Spokane Low Income Housing Consortium says that by the year 2021, I believe it is, and this report came out last year, we're gonna be short 11,000 units in Spokane of affordable housing units. So we may not be able to build our way out of the problem, but we've got to build a lot of housing to meet the need that we have. We've seen the um, program at the state level, the Housing Trust Fund, those dollars have been drying up. We're seeing cuts coming down the road in HUD dollars that we typically use from the federal government. So the only way we're gonna be able to meet any of our housing needs, whether that's for housing first options, for mental health, or for just straight affordable housing because rates are going up in the current housing stock in our community, is to build some more and also to look at other programs like what Boston's doing, that you put a risk fund together that would then back up somebody, a landlord, so that they can back up the money and we can do the repairs through that risk fund if somebody, um, they don't take vouchers now, but they should be taking vouchers, so if we can back the landlords up. But we've got to fundamentally build more 
and make more housing available. And we right now, we're going to be 11,000 short and we're losing federal and state dollars. And so in order to meet all of those levels, it's going to take us all coming together. And if you look at this in context of income inequality, income inequality in the United States is worse than it's been since 1929. There's a reason it's getting worse. And until we can have a conversation about how, if we're living comfortably, do we pay more to take care of those at the bottom? Because capitalism would collapse if we actually had a 0% unemployment rate. We live in a society and we're taken care of by that society. I live comfortably as a middle class person. But therefore, if you have a certain amount of unemployment that our system necessarily has, it's our moral responsibility to take care of those at the bottom. And we have to face that and actually pay to help people out. And so I really think that you do need to build more and we need to put more money in the community pot in order to do that. And Dave, I see you nodding. I want to give you some statistics to think about. In our shelter, it's about 350 people we house a night. Okay, in the last three months, we've had 480 people check into our shelter that have never checked in before. 480. We're just one shelter. So as we look at the housing and the problem, it's bigger. And I want to say, so you will never build your way out of it. Correct. And but there's, we do need more. We yeah, can agree on yeah, that. Yeah, I do. Yeah. But I think we have to be realistic with the numbers. We're seeing the homeless count that we flash out every year. It's not symbolic of what we see 12 months out of the year in terms of new people and the numbers. So we're dealing with something that is growing at rates we've never seen in the last year. So again, yeah, it doesn't mean you stop, you don't work toward it, but the issue is bigger than just, it's, it's huge. It's bigger it's than huge. any one of the isolated tactics that we've talked about. It's larger, it's a societal issue, and we need to be able to look in the mirror and say what that is and what are we going to do to fix that as a community. And it's not isolated to Spokane. This is countrywide. We're seeing this problem. And until we recognize it and talk about it, you know, I, at the Homeless Forum, I started out by talking about income inequality. And then 60 people stood up with solutions, and not one of them mentioned underlying problems. And you can't look at addiction as isolation. Addiction comes from loneliness and feeling that you can't get it. We're the, you know, the, my generation is the first generation that's not going to do better than my parents. That causes angst among people when we're not on an upward trajectory. That causes the problems that, that when you lose a job, you're one paycheck away from homelessness. Those are real issues that people face in our community. And we need to be able to actually talk about not just providing 24-7 shelter, but what is causing that rise in the problem that demands 24-7 shelter? And I think we're really afraid to talk about those things. Wealth is, like our CFO at the city, our treasurer, our city treasurer, Gavin Cooley, who's been there for seven different mayors and is one of the most innovative leaders I've ever seen, but he starts off every single finance meeting at the city of Spokane with an updated chart of income inequality and where the growth is occurring in our economy. And it's just a fact that we need to figure out and start really working towards real answers towards income equality. I want to get Dave in here first. So, so I'd like to say that I absolutely agree with you that we need to continue building and building and building and building. Uh, the Spokane Housing Authority really did align with the, the whole process that City of Spokane strategic plan and in, in ending homelessness. So in that, we, we've collaborated with numerous different agencies. We, we've created referral voucher programs, we've worked with youth programs, we've, we've collaborated with uh, Catholic Charities on every one of their chronic homeless buildings. We've put 40 vouchers in each one. We've put vouchers in uh, VOA buildings, transitions buildings. So, the, so you're right, and, and the voucher side of it helps because that's what helps pay that rent portion. That doesn't make them better. That just helps them get that stability, the home, so that they can have something going forward. You know, you sit and think about it, and every single person sitting in this room is one major event away from being homeless themselves. And, you know, and there's a lot of people out there, you know, middle class people, rich people, poor people, but people don't think about the fact that it just takes one major event, one thing in their life. I sat and talked to a gentleman one morning that was in our dumpster, and he got out and he goes, you know, dude, I, I had it all. I had a car, I had the house, I had everything. My wife passed away, I lost my job, and here I am sleeping in a dumpster. 
<coughs> my biggest goal was to get him out of the dumpster because that's the morning that they come to dump the dumpster. But here he was, he's in there, it's cold, wrapped up in the garbage to stay warm. And here's a gentleman that had everything and had a major life event that put him where he is now. And, and that's, I think, when we all sit here and think about it, mental health, education, youth, uh, seniors, anybody in our society that is in that vulnerable position, the first place they need to be is they need to be in that house. You can't have anything. You, you can't work out of a car. You can't get your kids to school out of a car. They don't feel safe. I mean, so you've got to start with that house. And so I agree. We need to build and build and build and build and build. We need to make as much affordable housing as we possibly can. And then we need to put as much subsidy as we can in every single one of those so that we can get the people in there so that they have the opportunity to work with the dollars they have, paying that 30% of their income to be able to actually progress somewhere. Can I jump on that as well? So yes, uh, I mean, housing, to do housing first, you have to have housing available first. Uh, it's just the way it works. And so uh, there's a lot of different solutions or trying to work on these different things. We were just in Washington, D.C. talking about changing the HUD definition of homelessness to match the Department of Education definition of homelessness. So there's actually two different definitions of homelessness in our government. And one of those is the HUD definition means you're on the street. The Department of Education means you, you may be doubled up with another family, you may be in your car, things like that. Um, you can't use these funds to help these people. But if you could help these people, you could prevent them from dropping into this category. And so we were talking with our congressional leaders about that um, within, this, within this area, but we have uh, which is the first time I've seen this in the, in the shelter world right now, is we have many families in the family shelter that have vouchers, that have deposits, first and last. They've got two, $3,000 cash and can't find a place. And so do, do, I'm the, just the disheartening fact of that, like I put in 15 applications that cost me $40 each and didn't get a place. Mm -hmm. And if, and if you, wanna, uh, yeah. you really want to quantify that, yeah. If you take a standard person that's on the voucher, and, and the voucher is good for up to 120 days, if you look at a person that has any kind of barriers whatsoever, typically you will see only 30% of the people that actually get a voucher have the ability to find a place and actually get into it. So if I call up 100 people a month, on the average, you're going to see 30 people over the course of 200 to 206 days that actually find a house that they qualify to get into and can afford to get into. Some of the other programs we've developed, and, and one of them is uh, a referral voucher program, and we used the McKinney-Vento um, definition for that one because we were, we were targeting youth homelessness. So we stepped away from the HUD definition, and we used the McKinney-Vento that said that doubled up, living in a car, um, they qualified as homeless. So we were able to put some of those vouchers in the hands of about four or five different uh, agencies that actually go out and help people to find housing. In that referral voucher side of it, and we now have 35 vouchers a month that go to about 13 different agencies, the, the success rate difference in just being able to have that assistance in finding the house is now 85% and housed in 45 days. So just being able to do that and, and to MOU or to contract with an agency that can provide the services that we can't provide it changes that much in the difference between 30% housed in 200 days to 85% housed in roughly 45 days. So, you know, you, you try and do an innovative thing. You're trying to, to step outside the box and do things. And we kind of like to say that we're just on that fine line of whether we're on the right side or the wrong side. But at this point, it works. And, and we're on the right side. So... Aza, I know you wanted to, to jump in. You've been well, patient. Way back in the conversation, I just uh, I, I was just really struck with um, what Rob said in this film, and I think that probably um, most of us at some point in our careers felt that um, people would not be successful in housing unless we were able to assist them in recovering from substance abuse or their medical problems or mental illness. And statistically, we found that the opposite is true. And I think Rob can really speak to that. And partnering um, agencies can speak to that. And, and the gentleman that was, that was 
um, describing, you know, the woman that's going to hear voices um, in the walls. Um, the thing about that woman is we know where she is and we can reach out and help her. And some people are able to sustain housing um, and still hear voices in the walls, but, but we don't see them. I mean, th there's these huge buildings full of people that are doing well, that are volunteering, that are going back to work, that are developing relationships. Um, but our community doesn't see those success stories because we're only seeing the folks that are coming into the shelters. It's like somebody working in a hospital. The, your reality is going to be eventually that everybody in Spokane is really sick. But I think it's really your reality, what you see every day. And, um, and if the housing is there, um, we can reach these people and help them in recovery. Thank you so much for waiting. You have a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, kind of twofold. Um, my name is Lane Pavey. I'm with Revive Reentry Services, um, advocate for the formerly incarcerated. We have estimated that there's about 78,000 people in Spokane with a felony conviction. We are one in three adult Americans. And I'm a little bit disappointed because I never see aggregated data that shows how many people on the streets actually have a felony conviction. And I don't hear us talking a lot about um, what we're doing when people have felony convictions. And we, we really need to look at that. So my two questions are mainly, um, since this film, I now have seven houses because people aren't able to transition. If you don't have a, a lease or a deed, you're homeless. But I know that that's not how you categorize it when they're coming down to services. And my, my main question is, how are you guys seeing your landlords um, that you work with uh, as their willingness to take in felony convictions, because when I hear that, that 30%, I know that almost none of those are felons. And I also get calls constantly from families who the parent or both parents have a felony conviction, and I send them down to Catholic Charities, and I never know what happens because I can't take families in my housing program. And I just wanted to see what you guys were doing and working on, and I know Dave Scott is right there, and we've been on some panels together talking about that, but what you're seeing as far as how people with felony convictions are um, getting into stable, supportive, or permanent housing. And then my second question is for the policymakers. Um, you know, referring to that box that we were talking about, if there's anything that you're doing to help people who really can work, do have a job, um, really need to get into housing because they actually could pay for it, um, what, what you guys are doing to ensure that those people have a, a good chance to be looked at for their qualifications first and their ability to pay uh, before their felony conviction. All right, let's start with the first question. So, so for the first question, uh, you know, we had, HUD had policies, they had requirements that were put on back in the mid-90s, and they, and they had very strict criminal policies. And so for the housing voucher program, we had very strict, very strict criminal policies we were, we were enforced to put in place. In the last administration, the Obama administration, it was very interesting because the disparate impact uh, started becoming the, really the kind of forefront of these people that were coming out of prisons and not being able to, to access services and not being able to do things. So it, it came down that we needed to look at our criminal policies. And so as a housing authority, we got, we got together with you know, a large um, group of people. We, we had felons in the room. We had um, Northwest Justice. We had Fair Housing. We had the Human Rights Commission. We had these people in the room and we said, what do we do to make the voucher accessible? So what we did is we went back to the basic HUD requirements, and that basically falls into, and, and this is a federal, this is the federal guideline is, is the sex offender piece that we can't help, and that's, that's just federal law. But it basically took every single other thing out of it. If sex offender, and if you were actually convicted of manufacturing meth in a public housing or a publicly assisted unit. So those were the only two things that we, out of this whole entire policy that was num numerous pages, we brought this thing down to basically two sentences. So the housing choice voucher doesn't stop a person. Now when they get to the landlord piece, that's where the, that's where the, the, the work becomes because they've got to be able to sell that themselves to the landlord and say, yes, I have this, but this is what's going on. And, and so we've taken ourselves out of being that barrier because the 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 onus really, you know, when it comes down to it, is that decision that the landlord makes. So, Shauna? Yeah, we, um, we used to have a, a reentry program that was housing people who were exiting 
institutions, whether it was um, for substance abuse or the criminal justice system. And we successfully have housed hundreds of people over the years, and we're still housing people with felonies on the record, um, as well as, as other crimes. But one of the things that we really work hard on doing is, is coaching our clients on how to sell themselves, um, how to talk with landlords, um, but then also having an agency behind them come in, and we do a lot of mediation and, and, and talk a lot with landlords about the clients. And, and so having that behind them and then also having our financial assistance, the case management, those types of things really does help. It's challenging, but housing people with felonies is possible. It's happening every day. Um, unfortunately, it's not always... I think, like I said before, the best housing. Um, but it's not on the streets. And so a lot of times, if you can get into some place and, and start building a positive rental history, credits, things like that, you can then move into other places, which is really helpful. And that's what we also try to, to get our clients to, to kind of understand is have the hope of, this might just be for today, but it's not forever. This is a step up. Let's start planning towards the next steps up as well. So, And policymakers. <laughs> the mayor led the charge and the city uh, banned the box as a city policy back in uh, 2014. Um, and the county just followed. That was actually in the paper last week. Um, but on November 8th, I think I'm dropping a law that will be voted on on November 27th that will require all employers to ban the box in the city of Spokane. And so then I think the next step after, after the box is banned on employment, because that was some of the examples that were in the documentary, is, is really working with Lane's group on what does that look like on banning the box in housing. And that, I think that goes tied hand in hand with things like risk bonds and other aspects. But I'm definitely in favor of it and uh, in favor, I think that people should be able to do background checks later, but if you put the box, and as a former private employer who used to do annual hiring for part-time workers every year, you would get 200 applications for 20 spots, and the easiest thing to take that list of 20 applications is to take everyone that's a felon off the list. And I know that from being in the private sector doing that. And I know other people are. And 70% of our employers ban the box in the city of Spokane already. It's just 30% that won't even give interviews. And that's the only way you can get in the door is if you meet people, because we all do deserve a second chance. I just want to talk for a moment, because I think, and, and, I've, uh, and the council president and I, and you, you said it, you wanted to know what do the policymakers think. And as we enter in to these policy decisions, I think we need to seriously look all the discussion we've had today is housing first is great, but it really isn't housing. You, uh, people have to take vouchers, but they aren't being taken. Uh, so even though we can ban the box, the problem is going to, or the, the issues addressed is going to be the case management and working with those that are re-entering. The work that, Lane, you're doing about housing and how do you get these people together and how do you do uh, uh, groups and how do you know the services out there that will take a second chance with you. And so, I, I mean, and I come from a philosophy that uh, the vast majority, you're not going to regulate yourself to success. And uh, we're, Ben and I are going to have this debate because, especially as we do it within the political boundaries of a city, what is somewhat frustrating to me, and I'll say it, that we have focused a lot on city of Spokane homelessness. This is a regional issue. And the more policies we do by drawing lines in the political boundaries, that doesn't make a difference whether you're north of Francis or south of Francis, east of Havana or west of Havana. I have, I have problems with, and typically employment law has been done at the state level, and I know we've worked on it, and it didn't get there, and so maybe we should lead as a city. And I know uh, this is going to be a lively debate, uh, and, and, but I, I, I worry that as soon as we pass it and we think done, uh, that the reality is the issues are subsequent to that. Yes, it's a big uh, initial issue, um, but when you implement policy, it has to be broad focused, it has to be enforced, that costs money. Uh, if we do it by complaint only, 
Uh, you know, that holds a whole nother uh, a level of uh, efficacy, meaning that who then gets complained and who doesn't. So I just suggest what I love about this is that we're discussing these and debating these and to see the county come board and other major employers. Um, but I don't want to just say that we pass it and, and this isn't going to continue to be an issue because it's going to take us all and to work with those folks because guess what? We just said it. We have all the resources with the vouchers and people are still having trouble. It takes case management. It takes working with them. It makes working through the system. Uh, so it's going to be much larger than that. But I do applaud that we're looking at it, but uh, I do still have reservations in, in, uh, in policy that is uh, very focused by political boundary and not by the issue that's in front of us. So speaking of that, we have pe 200 people that got jobs last year. If you're going to end homelessness, we've talked a lot about housing. Yeah. To me, it's about jobs. And let's, let's take this issue of a criminal record. Everyone that we have go to employees. We have 110 businesses that partner with us. If the person steps up and says, this is who I am, this is my past, this is what I've done to work on changing my life, I do have this criminal record. I found business after business after business that says, we'll give you a second chance. So you can avoid the boxes, which, you know, there's a legitimate thing. I think transparency, openness, honesty, people are willing to give a second chance. And so I think uh, that, you know, that, I see it every day. Uh, and again, I think one of the things the mayor is saying is people get connected with agencies that get to know people, can recommend them. People are willing to say, we'll help. And so uh, I, I can't speak enough of our city and the people, how responsive they are with a heart to help the homeless and give people a second chance. Thank you so much for waiting. You have Thank a question? You. Yes, my name is Eric Agnew. First, I just wanted to applaud all of our leaders on stage and those who are in the audience as well. Um, this has been a heavy topic tonight, but there's many hands here and many hands make the work light. So first, just thank you for what you do. I just wanted to ask, maybe you could just share some of the uh, job training and placement programs that might already be in place that we haven't spoken about already. And then also, is the city looking at doing anything maybe like um, what the city of uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico is doing, where they actually proactively help people uh, who may be panhandling for the day and give them the dignity of the work and a, and a, and a living uh, wage, maybe not a living wage, but a wage for the day um, to go out and do service work uh, in their community. Um, so just if you could build upon that, uh, that question of what are we doing to, to help people out of homelessness through jobs? I can offer that um, in the behavioral health care setting, we're looking at, we're right on the brink of some pretty significant transformation. And, um, and that's kind of conceptualizing uh, the parameters of what we offer in behavioral health care. And um, I think that in the very near future, within the next um, year or two, um, Medicaid, which is really you know the the coverage that um, supports uh, treatment for our impoverished people um, is going to expand to include and, and reimburse for um, services that are going to assist people and in in, um, in in developing skills and um, obtaining and sustaining employment and. I, I think that the models that I've been exposed to are evidence-based practices that um, are very inspiring and give a lot of hope and I think is a significant component that we've been lacking as a community to help get people out of poverty. And Mayor Condon, there has been some discussion about the jobs for panhandlers, Ab absolutely. that model out of Albuquerque. Um, a lot of, you know, R.J. Berry is the mayor of Albuquerque and I've spent some time, I actually went on the, was uh, on the bus uh, with, uh, there's a better way, I believe is what their program for members, right? And it again is a tactic at a larger strategy. The reality is yes, they give them a day's wage, but the guy that runs that is, is a social worker, and I don't have the numbers on the tip of my tongue, but really what it is is an opportunity for an intervention, to sit down with somebody, 
through work, through a 10-day work day or work hour day, and get them the services. And there's been uh, hundreds uh, that they've been able to get jobs, a couple hundred for our housing, 100 plus for jobs. Um, it's actually so popular that he now, the gentleman has to limit people to four days a month so that it doesn't become the actual employment for them, that they actually are looking at the, and on the ladder. But it, it's a small tactic, uh, it's, and here it's going to be called HopeWorks. Um, and the council has, uh, has funded uh, that program. But again, it's not the long-term strategy. Or, you know, it's, it's a tactic to, to have a conversation with somebody. You have to have that, uh, that time with someone on an individual basis, whether it be in a shelter, whether it be because you're doing work and getting paid that day to do that work. But we've got to encourage those interactions with professionals that know how to do this, that know how to uh, deal with uh, mental illness or, or addiction. Um, and that's where the resources need to go because we have the right people doing it uh, and we need to trust them to do that. Uh, we need more resources, uh, but I would have to, uh, what Rob talked about, there is, there is nuggets uh, of, of, and, and centers of excellence that Spokane should be very proud of. And Rob, what would you like to see as far as the job piece? You know, on the job piece, I think employment's a big part of it, but there has to also be an understanding that a lot of our chronic homeless street people are not able to work. Their, their mental health challenge or their addiction challenge is so profound that they are virtually unemployable. And there has to be a space for them, for us to hold them too. Uh, and, and a lot about this too is what the mayor just said about personal connections. And even tonight's documentary, it's about the optics of homelessness. It's about what we think about homelessness, how we talk about it. You know, for the, the thousand or so homeless people that are in downtown streets in Spokane, that's, that's a concern. But really the bigger concern for me are the 300 something thousand people in Spokane and how they look at those people, how they describe them, how they talk about them. Because it's very easy to vilify and criminalize the homeless and to look at them and say, it's their own fault, they're lazy, they're addicted, they want to be homeless. Where are they getting money for those cigarettes? You know, and then all of a sudden it's easy to dehumanize them and write them off when those are the optics. But I think the documentary shows the optics are different than that. These are individuals, they're human beings, they need personal relationships, uh, and, and to, to de-vilify them and de demyth the homelessness. You know, I have some of my own best donors who tell me, you know, gosh, Rob, uh, you know, the food's so good at the House of Charity and you're building so many nice apartments, you're gonna attract homeless people from Alabama and Florida and Texas. And my response to that is, first of all, the data doesn't show that. Second of all, so what? You know, years ago when Sacred Heart and Providence sat down to think about building a children's hospital, do you think they sat around a conference room table and said, God, I don't know, should we build a children's hospital? We might attract more kids with cancer. They didn't have that conversation. Why should we have that conversation about the homeless? Most of our homeless are from here. The ones that aren't, we should serve them anyway. And I think the city and, and the county do a good job of that and all the partners around this table. Jobs is a piece of it, but there's a huge number of people that can't work and there has to be a space for them too. Well said. Discussions like this will obviously help. It will raise the bar, start the conversation, continue the conversation. You see this every day, Joe. Yeah, I think that the, the piece that I want to add to this is there is one common denominator with homelessness, no matter which type of homelessness you're talking about, and that's a loss or lack of community. For some reason, you've lost those relationships, whether it's hurts that you've done to others or that's been done to you, habits, uh, hang-ups that you have, uh, or just it, some type of environmental factor that has happened. And so when we're talking about homelessness, we're talking about a community issue. So it's not just this one department, this one agency, this, this city. We're talking about our community as a whole. So that means faith-based needs to be involved in this. That means nonprofits need to be involved in this. That means government needs to be involved. And that means business needs to be involved. Uh, this is a community issue and we need to have a community response to it. We need to be putting our people in positions where they can build relationships um, so that you can get that job or so that the next time that you are threatened, you are calling on a friend that you can stay at their place rather than falling into the shelter or falling onto the street. And so uh, this is a community response. It's relational. Uh, and so we need to approach it in a relational way. Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, that's all the time we have for this conversation. I'd like to thank our distinguished panel and our audience members from the Spokane Homeless Coalition for being a part of this discussion and for the work that they do every day to fight homelessness in our community. 
It's encouraging to see how many people and organizations are dedicated to finding shelter and comfort for men, women, children, and families without a roof over their heads or a place to call home. For KSPS, I'm Teresa Lukens. Thank you for joining us. Good night.